Well, why have you come here this week? What's the point of being here at the ABBA conference? Maybe you wandered in this evening on a whim. Maybe you were curious to see what all the noise was about. If so, well, like I said, welcome. What a good place to be. I'm hearing God's word this evening. But why have you come if you're a Christian? Maybe you've been here for 20, 25, 34. Was it? That's a, a, a pretty impressive record. But why have you come this evening? Why are we Christians at all? Why do we bother with this? 2,000 years after this man called Jesus apparently walked the earth. Why do we bother? What good is it to a world that is aching with suffering, that needs real solutions to real problems? What good is it to a world that is struggling? What good is it to a world that has moved on from this ideology to that ism, to that and the next thing and the next thing? What good is all of this? What good is Christianity? Why are we here? Well, we're here because Jesus lives. We're here because Christ is risen. You don't have to say it right now. You can save it for later on. We're here because Christ is risen. But what is the resurrection all about? I mean, perhaps we know that it's about confirming what Christ did a couple of days beforehand on Good Friday. We know that, don't we? It was, it's all about him saying when it, it, when it was finished, when he said that, that it really was finished because he rose again. Death couldn't hold him any longer. It really was done, whatever it was he was doing that Friday. But what else did it do? What was the resurrection all about? Well, we learned three things about the resurrection in this story. We learned that it turns grief to joy, that it turns fear to gladness, and that it turns doubt to faith. And adding to all of those things, it gives a mission. A mission for Mary, a mission for the disciples, and a mission for Thomas. But first of all, it starts with um, real sadness, real emptiness, emptiness in the tomb, emptiness in Mary's heart. My sister, um, my little sister, a good number of years ago now, on her birthday, was really looking forward to a, a, a present. It was a, a pair of hair straighteners, kind of pretty posh hair straighteners you could get back then called GHDs. I don't know if you were into hair straightening, that kind of thing. But they were nice hair straighteners. She'd be looking forward to getting, getting that, asked mum and dad for those. And on her birthday, a box, a suspiciously right-looking box, arrived. And it was wrapped well, and she unwrapped it, but it was a little bit light. So she opened it and pulled out a bit of cotton wool and then some more cotton wool, and I can't remember what was in there. I think it was maybe a wooden spoon or something, but it wasn't the hair straighteners that she wanted. And you can imagine the, the look on her face, the kind of, of uh, her life that was kind of filled with adolescent kind of materialism, and the look on her face when she opened the present, the thing that she'd always been longing for, at least for a, f- a few weeks anyway. Um, and it wasn't there. It was empty. I wonder if you've ever known a feeling like that when it comes to Christmas presents or birthday presents or your hopes in life. But with Mary, that's a silly example. Imagine what she's going through here. Imagine what Mary is feeling. To do that, maybe you need to know a little bit about who Mary was. Mary was somebody with an extremely troubled history, a really checkered past, somebody who Jesus had rescued from that past, cast many demons out of her, freed her, from her former life, rescued her to be who she really was. Mary loved Jesus. Jesus said of her once, well, she she is somebody who's received much, and so she's loved much. J.C. Ryle puts it like this, she was last at his cross. She's there among those small group of women and one man at the cross. She was last at his cross and first at his grave. She stayed longest there and was soonest here. She couldn't rest until she was up to seek him. She sought him while it was yet dark, even before she had light to see him by. She comes looking for Jesus. I don't know what she was expecting because the tomb had a big stone rolled over it and a guard placed in front of it. Who knows what she was expecting, but imagine what she's going through when she reaches the tomb, sees the stone blown away, and there's nobody there. There's no body there. Can you imagine that? Not just a frustrating kind of emptiness when you get the wrong present on your birthday, but the sadness of all of her dreams crumbling, perhaps the similar kind of sadness as as losing a child or losing a spouse who you'd only just married. As you think about all of those future plans, all of those hopes, all of those things that you look forward to, that future that you had together, and it's gone in an instant, I think it's that kind of sadness. 
that they were in your hands. He was in her hands. He'd fixed everything. She was there for him. And then he died. He's gone. All of her dreams have come to a a tragic end. All that she's left with is memories. This inexpressible pain in her gut. Perhaps you know a similar kind of thing. He's dead now. But worse than dead, his body's gone. She doesn't even have anywhere to go and do whatever she was going to do that morning. There's no grave. There's just weeping. And weeping is repeated over and over again. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? Because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. I wonder if you've ever known a feeling like that. I wonder if you've ever lost someone that you've loved. If you've ever lost the future. If it's been ripped away with you. Well, life can be cruel, can't it? There's a real finality to it that hangs over everything. That steals away what we want most. Steals away love without parting. Steals away life without end. Makes it feel like evil triumphs over good. It's, it's the finality of death. Isaiah talks about it as a blanket that hangs heavy over humanity, that robs us of joy and gladness, that robs us of hope and a future, something that sours every human joy and sweetness. Because all of that comes to an end in death, ultimately. What do you make of a situation like that? What do you do in a situation like this? Perhaps you do the British thing and keep calm and carry on, make the most of it, have a stiff upper lip. That's always confused me though, because with me it's my bottom lip that goes, isn't it, when, you're, when you want to cry. So I don't know why it's a stiff upper lip. But anyway, um, life goes on perhaps, you know, just get used to it. That's what life is all about. I don't know how Mary was preparing to handle it. And perhaps she wasn't really. Perhaps she was trying to begin to come to terms with Jesus as a good teacher, as a, a moral inspiration that he wasn't there anymore. Perhaps there was anger and denial and confusion and all of those cycle of things that go around in grief. But in this story, well, that's not the end of the story. In this story, something huge changes. Not just for Mary, by the way, but for you and I. Something totally unexpected happens. In all of her grief and confusion, going to the tomb, a tomb that's been sealed, and who knows what she's going to do, but in all of her grief and confusion, a voice speaks. We were hearing about this voice this morning. A voice speaks, and she turns, and she doesn't realize it at first, but it's him. It's the master, the Lord, raised to life again. And as Sam said in his prayer, everything sad begins to come untrue. I mean, could it be true? Could it it be real that he's really alive and standing there? Did you see that repeated through? That he's standing with her and standing with the disciples. Not lying prone in a tomb, wrapped up, bundled up, hidden away. But he's standing there, out in front of everybody, in front of her. Not wrapped up, just resuscitated like Lazarus was. Do you remember him stumbling out of the tomb, wrapped up in his grave clothes? They had to move the stone for him. No, Jesus wasn't just resurrected. And how on earth is this, is this possible? That he's gone through death and gone out the other side. This shadow that terrifies everyone, really, when you begin to think about it, when you begin to find those new gray hairs. This shadow that creeps ever closer with every creak of the knee. You try and put it off and you put it to the back of your mind, but I wonder if you felt it. The cold creep of death as it steps ever closer with each passing day, that blanket weighing over humanity. Well, death, he has beaten it. He's torn it in two. He has ripped its teeth out at the roots. You must understand this. It's not resuscitation like Lazarus, where they had to move the the stone and take the, the wraps off of him, where death lost its hold for a moment, but a few months or years, we don't really know, later, Lazarus was was taken into death again. It's not resuscitation like that. No crucifixion sees to that kind of thing. Look at the details of it, and you'll see there's no coming back to life from that. It's not reincarnation either, where you're reborn into another corruptible body. You know, in the caught in that that never-ending life cycle of death and decay, and being in somebody else's body or an animal or whatever it is. It's not like any of those things. This is resurrection. This is a new kind of life recognizable but new, like a seed is to a plant. In a body, a new kind of life in a body that can be seen and touched, that can be held, that can be cutched, that can eat, that doesn't float two feet off the ground, but whose feet touch and feel the grass. A body that can dance, 
a body that can go for long walks and stay up for late night chats, a body that somehow passes through those grave clothes but still has the time to stay behind and fold them up, a body that passes through the stone. You realize you didn't need to move the stone, did you? That it's moved so that we can see in, not for him to get out. He's not like Lazarus. No, Jesus is alive. He has his flesh and bones, not just in the old story, but in historical reality. Jesus has his flesh and bones, not as a metaphor, not as some higher truth, not as some psychological experience that the, that the disciples had. It's impossible. There's no such thing as a corporate delusion like that. It's not just that he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart as if I shut my eyes and switch off my rational mind and just believe. No, he really lives. He lives. He made his mark on history. Follow the evidence and you'll see where it leads that Jesus gave us evidence to see and to taste and to touch and to read and hear about with our senses. He made his mark on history. Jesus, a Middle Eastern man who did remarkable things, who was brutally executed, but three days later, there he was. Wouldn't that be a wonderful sight? There he was, standing there with Mary's name on his lips. He was actually alive. And mad as it seems, okay, rationality bending, um, scientific law defying as it seems, he was actually alive. Follow the evidence where it leads and you'll find that it's compelling. Come to him, speak to him, hear him speak to you and you'll know that he lives. But what does it mean? What does it mean for you and I today? Because if it's true, then whether you believe it or not, if it's true, it has eternal significance, really deep significance for you and for me. No other fact in history is more important than this. Whether you believe it or not, whether you think that Christianity is a, a good way of life or not, whether you agree with Christian morality or not, whether you have been to church a million times or not at all, wh- whoever you are, this fact of history has eternal significance for you. But what does it mean? Well, I want you to look with me at these three different people, at Mary, at the disciples, at Thomas, Three people feeling intensely human emotions, but deeper than emotions, aren't they? Three intensely human states of being, or postures, grief, doubt, fear. Look, even though they lived many years ago, they aren't so far from you and I, are they? So there's Mary, consumed with grief, the disciples paralyzed by fear, and Thomas entangled in his doubts. Each of those situations... Into each of those situations, Jesus walked, literally. He walked in and changed everything for those people, and he does exactly the same today. If you don't know what that's like, perhaps turn to the person next to you at the end and ask them if they know this. Ask them if Jesus has walked into their lives and changed everything for them, and what does that look like, and and what is it like, and perhaps how could that happen for me as well? Well, let's think of Mary first. Grief turned into joy and a mission. Mary's consumed by grief. But Jesus comes to her and changes everything. I wonder if you've ever observed and thought about how our culture deals with grief or how you deal with it. At being distraught at the loss of a loved one. When perhaps life seems pointless, it loses all of its color and meaning is all stripped away. Well, one way our culture deals with it is with sentiment and the cold comfort of of things like, well, they're in a better place now. But are they really? I mean, is there any place at all after death? And if there is, how can we know that it's any better? And how can I know if I'll be going there? That's one way of dealing with it, with a bit of sentiment. Or you could go down Mufasa's circle of life kind of way of dealing with it, with a bit of spirituality. Well, it sounds nice to begin with, but it's really just empty sentiment again. And you as a person disappear in the circle of life. There's no personality in the grass that your carbon, your nu- the nutrients in the chemistry of your body um, nourishes. There's no personality in that grass. There's no love there. It's just your chemistry being used to fuel the next cycle of futile existence as the world goes round and round in a circle. There's no love there. There's no you there. It sounds good when you sing it with the Lion King to begin with, but Um, But as you sit back and think about it, it, it's actually very bleak, isn't it? You disappear. There's no you anymore. There's no love. There's no personality. Those are a couple of ways that our culture deals with it. But what does the resurrection say to grief? 
The resurrection says God has walked that road with you. He knows what it's like. Not just in some omniscient sense, but that he's walked in our suffering. That not, not another God has scars, but Christ alone. He's walked that road with us. He's passed through the veil and come out the other side. If you've ever seen the television show Band of Brothers, there's a, a mad episode where the um, soldiers of um, one of the US airborne divisions in the Second World War are, are pinned down, really, in some forest in the Battle of the Bulge, I think it was, pinned down in the forest, and eventually they try and break out and assault this town called, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Is it Carentan? No, it's not Carentan. Is it Carentan? Okay, anyway, this is a city in France, and this um, slightly insane officer um, called Spears, Ronald Spears, I think his name was, um, realizes that they've lost radio contact with part of their unit that are on the other side of the town. They've kind of, I don't know how they've managed it, but they, they got lost from each other. They realize that the half of their unit's on the other side of the town, that they're on this side. They can't use the radio. They can't get in touch with them. So he does something slightly mad. He gets up and runs through the town, filled with Germans who are confused and don't know what on earth he's doing. And he gets there, passes on the message, and then the, the narrator of the, um, of the show says the amazing words. He says the most remarkable thing wasn't that he went there in the first place, but it was that he came back. He stepped out and ran back through the German line, through the whole of the town, and jumped back over the wall and, and spoke to his own men. Well, Christ has done that through the veil, passed through, through death. What on earth is God doing? dying on a cross for us. It, it seems almost insane, doesn't it? <laughs> to, to an nth degree when you compare it to a, a soldier running through enemy lines. But the most amazing thing isn't just that he went into death for us, but was that he came back. John makes absolutely sure that we get this, that it is Jesus. Did you see that? Just in a couple of sentences, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus Jesus said to her, you can make no mistake about it. He goes through death and out the other side, he comes back. There is life beyond the grave then. We can know because somebody's been there and returned and shown us what, what it's like. And what is it like? Well, it's personal. It's not some circle of life sentiment. It's not some vague hope that there might be something beyond. It is personal. What do I mean well, by that? Well, I mean that you can recognize Jesus. Mary didn't for the moment. It was something completely beyond her imagination, but she recognized him. See, life after death isn't a faceless, loveless recycling of your energy. Now, if you're trusting in Jesus, it is a new body, recognizable. This is how um, Joni Erickson Tada puts it. Joni Erickson is a, a woman who, um, in her teenage years, jumped into a lake that was too shallow and broke her neck. She's been a paraplegic since her early years, um, from the neck down, but a Christian, trust in the Lord, and she says this about the Christian hope, that I can still hardly believe it, that I, with shriveled, bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, right, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling, can you imagine the hope this gives to someone spinal cord injured like me, or someone who has cerebral palsy, brain injured, or has been, who has multiple sclerosis? Imagine the hope that gives to someone who is manic depressive. No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, hearts, and minds. Only in the gospel of Jesus do hurting people find hope. It's a stunning thing, isn't it? The Bible puts it this way, that Jesus is our first fruits, that he's, if you like, the first apple from the tree. And if it's crunchy and if it's sweet and if it's good to the eye and pleasing to the touch, then you, you know that the rest of your apple crop is gonna be good. And that if Jesus, the first born from the dead, the first fruits of the resurrection, if he's out in a body through death, a body you can cut and eat with and sit with and, and talk with, well then that will be our future too. He's the first of the crop, but there's more to follow. So as Christians, how do we handle grief? Well, we don't mourn as those who have no hope. We grieve, we do grieve, because death still hurts, but there's no sting in the tail for a Christian. Christ has pulled the teeth of death from the roots, so now, if you like, death wears dentures. Um, there's no venom left, it still hurts to be bitten, 
but there's no power, there's no venom there. We grieve because death still hurts, but there's no sting in the tail for a Christian. See, the common New Testament picture for it is falling asleep. Not that we're unconscious until the resurrection, but that one day he'll raise us up, as Luke was speaking about this morning. He'll raise us up in new bodies. Well, long years have passed, says one old song, and still we face the fear of death, which steals our loved ones, leaving us undone, and still confronts us, beckoning with icy breath, the final terror when life's course is run. But this I know, the Savior passed this way before, his body clothed in immortality. The sting's been drawn. The power of sin has been destroyed. We sing death has been swallowed up in victory. So how do we handle grief as Christians? Well, we mourn and we grieve, but we realize that Christ is turning that grief into joy, not giving us some great consolation that we'll just make up for it, but he's swallowing up that sadness, taking that death into himself, and then bringing something new from it. Christ had to die, didn't he? The saddest and most wicked day in all of human history. Christ had to die, but from that death and sadness, new life was born. And so with the sadness on the earth, we face our griefs, and yet we don't face them just holding out hope for something a bit better to take the edge off the pain in the future. We hold out hope for the resurrection, for Christ to swallow up all of that sadness and bring it to new life. Well, grief turns to joy. But perhaps grief is not your thing. Perhaps you don't come to the conference particularly sad or struggling in that way. Perhaps fear is more what you struggle with this evening. Well, let me say, if God is for us, if this kind of God is for us, then who can be against us? That's what the disciples learn here. I mean, they're scared, they're petrified, aren't they? When Jesus was around, they were full of hope. Jesus said, follow me, and they dropped everything and followed him. Think of what they left behind. Their jobs, their livelihoods, their security. Think of what they were looking forward to just a few days before, arguing about who was gonna be the greatest and who would sit at his right and at his left when he came into his kingdom and he fixed everything and kicked out the Romans and did what the Messiah was supposed to do. They were hoping for so much but now he's dead. Now it's over. And all of those hopes for the renewal of Israel, all of their hopes for the future, all of, all of their dreams are crushed as well. The dream is over. So what do they have left? Well, get your head down and just hope that you'll ride out the storm. Imagine what it would be like going back to your home. I wonder if people would be there watching for you to come back, knowing that you were one of those people who was with that upstart Jesus. Imagine the fears that they have of of ever being able to get a job again, of ever being able to feed and provide for their children again. Fear for their reputations, and far beyond that, fear for their own lives. Because if they came for him, then they'll, surely they'll be coming for us next. And so they've locked themselves in a room. They're terrified. But then Jesus walks in, literally, and turns everything upside down. Um, Because it turns out he's alive. He's alive, and the worst thing that the authorities could do, well, they did it, and he beat that. They couldn't stop him. They killed him, but now he's alive again, like in that great story of Aslan and the wicked white witch. She does her worst. She gets Aslan on the stone table and cuts his throat, and every, everything is tragedy, but then somehow, s- somehow, he, he's alive again, and spring begins to break out and snow begins to melt and everything sad begins to come untrue and fear begins to melt away. The authorities have done their worst but they still couldn't stop him. What else could they possibly do to Jesus? What else could they possibly do that he couldn't overcome? So fear is gone or at least fear of the authorities. Gladness fills their hearts eventually Because if this God is for you, I mean, the kind of God who can raise people from the dead, then who can be against you? What can man do to me? But that is a big if, isn't it? If God is for us. Can we be sure of that, really? Especially considering what I've done. Especially considering those things that um, that keep me up at night. Especially considering, think of someone like Peter, who's denied Jesus over and over again. Is it really good news? When he comes back, 
And what is he going to do to us? What is he going to say to us? The debt that I owe to God is enormous. When I stand before him, if Peter's standing before him in that room, or when I stand before him on that final day and give an account of my life and how I've used the talents that he's given to me, and he says, well, what have you done? What will I say to him? You see, there is a fear that's far worse than the fear of authorities. It's the fear of the one who is in authority over all things, the one who holds my eternal destiny in his hands. As Jesus said, I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after having been killed, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Well, who is that one? Well, John met him a few years later on the island of Patmos. At the, right at the beginning of his vision of Revelation, you read of Jesus coming and appearing to John and of him saying, I am, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Now we're terrified. Standing in the room with a person who can lock you into death for eternity. But there's good news there too, because really the one who's standing there is the one who can lock you out of death, lock you into eternal life for eternity too, because look at what he says. And he knows exactly what they're feeling. He knows exactly what to say. He stood among them and said, peace be with you. I haven't come to throw you out into the darkness. I haven't come to lock you out of the kingdom in disappointment. I have come to bring you peace And so that's the answer. How can I stand on that final day? How can I ever hear him say, peace be with you? Well, it's because of Good Friday. It's because of what he did a couple of days earlier on. It's because of the kind of death that he died, that Jesus stood in your place, if you've put your trust in him, that he stood in my place, that he stood under the violence of God so that we could know the peace of God, that he stood under the wrath and anger of God at sin, that he became sin for us, that he drunk that cup to the dregs, that he was a a burnt offering, burnt up in God's anger, that he died in darkness, that he, if you like, lost the face of God, that he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That he was forsaken so you could be welcomed. See, the resurrection does say it is finished that your debt is paid, that that whatever it is that you've done that keeps you up at night, bring it to him, and it can be gone, it can be cleaned away, that there is nothing for you to fear. It would be wrong and unjust and unholy of God to punish you again for something he's already punished Jesus for. And he can't be unholy or wrong or sinful, so you're safe in him. He can come and say, peace. You can know complete safety and security in him. We can stand before God with confidence, because Jesus stood on our behalf. We're hidden in him and welcomed into his father's presence as his children. Did you see that? Did you hear what Jesus said to Mary? Did you hear the message that she was to go and give? Her mission was to say this. Uh, Let me find it. To say this, um, do not cling to me. I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God, and your God, my Father, and your Father, my God, and your God. Do you know him as your God this evening? Do you know him? Can you say with great confidence that the Lord is my helper? I will not be afraid. What can mortals do to me? Because if that kind of God is for you, then what is there left to fear? That they can perhaps ruin your reputation. But the God who made the universe loves you treasures you, sees you, and knows you. So why worry that they can take away your job, but that he'll look after you like he looks after the sparrows and clothes the lilies? It'll only be a few years that there'll be the church to gather around and help you out if you lose your life's work. But what is there to look forward to? To life with him forever in that inheritance where we'll work with him where there'll be no more thorns and thistles and there'll be a a renewed earth to work and enjoy together. They might take your reputation. They might take your uh, your work. 
they might well take your life. But what do they do then? They only transform you into a more glorious creature than you could ever imagine. They only bring you to see the Lord Jesus face to face and one step closer to seeing him in your flesh restored. You see, to live now is to know Christ, is to know peace, is to be completely secure. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So we can sing as we've already sung, because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all of my fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life really is worth living, just because he lives. So Mary's given a mission to go and tell the disciples. The disciples see him, and then they're given a mission to go and take this to the world, to bring the offer of forgiveness to anybody who'll listen to open the doors of the kingdom to, to all. Think of Peter as the example. Think of him denying Christ around that little glowing charcoal fire in terror at a little servant girl who says, you've been with Jesus, haven't you? No, 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 it wasn't me. Think of Peter standing there and then how as Jesus comes and speaks peace to him, as the, the dawn of the resurrection blazes into his view, it blows away all of his fear, turns it to gladness, and what does Peter do? He goes and tells everyone who'll listen. Not just that he was with Jesus at the risk of his life, but that you must be with Jesus at the, lift, risk, at the risk of your life, that you must come and, know him tr- come and know him too. But is there a question in your mind, especially if this is your first time at a Christian meeting this evening, is there a question that Thomas asks? Is it really true? Perhaps you're rightly skeptical. I mean, it, it is a big claim, isn't it? That God has walked the earth, that God has died, and that he's resurrected, that a man who walked the earth rose again, never to die, that he still has flesh and bones, as we sang earlier on. Can you really have love without parting? Can you really know personal life after death? Can you really know security that's so sure that there's no need to fear or worry any longer? Can you really know forgiveness for your sin and peace with God? Can you really know purpose? You know, life's purpose. Not having to wait into your 30s to work out what you want to do with your life, but purpose to go and and tell anybody who'll listen that Jesus is alive. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But seriously, a man coming back from the dead? It just doesn't happen. I mean, Thomas is a realist, isn't he? He says, I need evidence. I need to know that it really happened. I need to see. I need to touch. I need to sense it. And so how do we answer that question today? Perhaps you are saying, look, this can't happen. It just doesn't happen. It's against the laws of physics and chemistry and biology and nature and everything that we know that somebody comes back from the dead. Well, look, there's compelling evidence for it in history. And the fun thing is that it's a historical fact. Christianity isn't just an ism. It's not just a, a set of beliefs that you can only really say is, you know, either works or it, it doesn't work. You can, it's not something that, that you just learn by experience. It's something that you can look at in history and test and see whether it really happened. Because if Christ rose from the dead, like I said, it's true for everyone, whether you believe it or not. And it has eternal significance for your life. And it happened in history, so you can go back and study and look and and check and work it out. So why don't you do that? Don't submit to yourself to voluntary blind prejudice. Don't just say, oh, well, it can't happen, so it didn't happen. So I'm not going to look at the evidence. No, it really happened in history. There's compelling evidence that it did. So go and have a look. If you want to do that, there's a book that's going to be on the bookstore that I guess opens tomorrow night called this, Your Verdict, Your Verdict on the Empty Tomb, written by a solicitor. And by a lawyer, he works through the evidence and lays it out and then asks you, what do you think? What's your verdict? Maybe if you're a complete skeptic about not just Christ's resurrection, but really all of this to do with Christianity and even whether there's a God at all. Well, this is a good book to to get into. Jesus for skeptics. If that's you, then um, that's something for you. Let me encourage you to go and look at the history, to study it, and you'll see that this really is written as history. I mean, did you see the details? He told you, John told you who got to the tomb first and that he didn't go in but he looked in and then that the other guy came and he went into the tomb and he saw it folded up. It reads like real history and it is and you can work it out for yourself. You can 
make your own verdict. So go and have a look at some of the evidence. It really is true. What you see, um, when you see that it's true, what you see when, we, when you come to Thomas's position of coming and investigating the Lord Jesus, of having him come and stand before you, what you see is that he lives, that he really is real. You don't just get that through historical investigation, but in meeting other Christians as they live out and walk in his ways as part of his body. You get that as you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come and show you and speak to you that you would, in a similar way to Thomas, but not quite, that you would know Christ lives, not just as a historical fact, not just as an object of study, but that he lives and that he speaks and that he will live and walk with you today. When you look into it, you'll find the evidence really is compelling, that there is no doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, then he's king over everything. If he's beaten death, that final enemy that nobody has come close to defeating in all of human history, if he's been through it and out the other side, then has he not proven it once and for all? That he's not just some moral teacher. And plenty of moral teachers say, this is the way, but Jesus says, I am the way. They say, this is life over here, but Jesus says, I am the life. I am the resurrection. See, Jesus is no mere myth to entertain the children at bedtime. This Jesus is Lord, whether you believe it or not. This Jesus is Lord. And so the, the search for meaning, the search for um, who we are, the search for your purpose, the search for the A to Z of, of human life is over. It's here in the Lord Jesus. He is the living one, the Alpha and the Omega. So if you don't know him, well, you need to know him. It's a good idea in your doubts to ask for evidence. It's not a wrong thing that Thomas does to say, I need to see him. I need to know that this is really true. I don't just want to take a, a leap of faith with nothing. It's a good thing to ask questions, but don't just ask questions. Take a good long look and search your heart and realize that perhaps the biggest reason you haven't come to know Jesus is because you don't really want to. Well, come and do some digging. Come and find him. Come and consider that if it's really true that he can give us love without parting, isn't it worth investigating it? Isn't it worth coming and bowing the knee to him and saying, my Lord and my God? Well, what's the point of being here this week? The point of being here this week is to learn more of Christ, to draw closer to him. We're here because of the resurrection. What is the resurrection all about? Well, are you weeping? Well, then come to Jesus. Let him comfort you. Come and see him risen from the dead, the sure hope of your resurrection, the sure hope of him making all sad things come untrue. Are you weeping? Come to Jesus. Are you afraid? Come to Jesus. See that the worst thing humanity could ever dream up happened to him. And he came through the other side. He came back for you. So whatever happens to you, you can handle it. Because he handled it and he's walking with you. Are you afraid? Come to Jesus. Are you doubting? Come to Jesus. Come and investigate. Come and search. Come and meditate. And come and marvel at the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't stop there. This isn't just something for us. For us personally. Something for us to take to the world. Mary took it to the, to the disciples. The disciples took it to all corners. Thomas took it to India and died there. So where will you take this gospel? Next door? To someone that you might bump into on the seafront or in a cafe this week? If you still have your health, you jolly well should be thinking about taking this to the other side of the world because there are thousands of tribes and billions of people who still have no idea who the Lord Jesus is, who still can't even accidentally come across his name. So if you have your health, seriously think and pray. Go to the missions exhibition and consider whether you should go. I mean, we should all go, but consider whether you should go and cross continents and use the rest of the time God has given you on this mission to take the good news of this risen Savior to the world. He really is alive, you know. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.